Good morning, again. Uh, so nice for me to have you all here uh, listening to me talking about gRPC, what it is and why you should maybe have a look at it. Yeah, so who am I? I'm from Romania, I'm an independent consultant. Um, I organize a .NET user group, I teach .NET, and I blog from time to time, not as, I often, uh, as often as I would like to. But I've, I've been busy doing this. I said while I'm on maternity leave, I, I will do something important to my career, uh, and I did that. So a book aimed at uh, beginners, uh, talking about all kinds of things around web and web API. So if you know someone uh, that might benefit from reading that. Cool. So I'm going to start with a story, because I like stories. And since uh, I started developing with .NET web forms, does that sound familiar? Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> it sounds familiar. Yeah, so uh, back in the days, we had monoliths with web forms, because that's how the framework used to work. But with the monoliths, that we have back then, everything was very easy, at least for me as a junior developer. Uh, and uh, I will have to ask you, who here enjoyed or enjoys, why not, working with monoliths? I, I'll be the first one <laughs> saying that, admitting it. Why? Well, because easy, uh, it, it gives us an easy life as developers. Everything is in the same code base, everything is in there. You do not have to worry that you will break something if you change something. You do not have to work straight things um, like, yeah, services, other services, so on. The deal with the uh, monolith is that it's hard to scale in specific scenario. You can scale it, but it will cost a lot for components of the system that, uh, well, maybe they are not used that much. So the scaling for that is just a waste of money. OK, so we started from this kind of architectures where everything was self-contained. We had uh, web forms, we had MVC that pretty much did the same thing. Yeah, it tried the logical separation of the code, but in the end, everything was on the server side. The HTML was uh, outputted from the, from the server side and so on. And then we realized that the next big thing is to split the front end and the back end into two separate things. So then we started to <laughs> adopt the next big thing back then, like REST APIs. Yeah, so I'm going to ask another thing. Who here develops REST APIs? Mm -hmm. So who here really <laughs> develops REST API respecting all the constraints that REST should have? Mm-hmm, yeah, exactly, so I'll be the... Oh, I see one hand here, good for you. I start from the open API and then uh, I... Okay. Uh, so I follow the, the standards. That's awesome. Yeah, but let's admit it, most of us did the same thing. We're basically having not REST API, we call them RESTful APIs, but we have J HTTP APIs that return JSON. Yeah, that's what we have. So, since we have that, and we all know that the future is distributed well, then we started to kind of have things like this. One front end that consumes a lot of backends. Then another architecture uh, kind of appeared. We have backends for front ends and uh, things like that. And then we started to have uh, microservice architectures, yeah, having small things that serve JSON to be consumed by a consumer that usually is a client app, or why not, is another server, because that's basically what gRPC were going to be. Yeah, so uh, the main purpose of gRPC would be to be consumed by another server in the role of a consumer. Yeah, so then there are, might be systems that have this kind of uh, polyglot uh, infrastructure architecture. So we might have like a uh, .NET consuming a Go service and stuff like that. Yeah, so we might have that. Have you ever seen it in real life? Like .NET that app consuming something from Java? You've seen it, yeah? But you see there are not a lot of us that <laughs> have seen this, <laughs> this exotic thing uh, in real life, yeah? Because we all know that we all have REST for everything and REST, or HTTP APIs, supposedly uh, talk in JSON, which is common for any kind of um, 
language framework that we might uh, need and encounter. So <coughs> I might ask you, okay, so why are you here? Why am I here talking about gRPC? Because we all have REST, right? So what's wrong with it? Why shouldn't we use REST for everything? Yeah, If you have a messaging architecture that you're using buses, queues, and stuff like that, yeah, that's another level. But when you start with microservices, the first thing that you do is to create an HTTP client, get data from one side to another, because that's the normal step to do. And then once you evolve your architecture, then you might uh, actually use a message broker. Yeah, So there's nothing wrong with REST, but we kind of use it everywhere. Yeah, and because we use it everywhere, we might have like not so performant services, or we might as well have a look at other technologies that might bring an extra ben uh, benefit for us. Yeah, and we all know that there are other technologies out there that can maybe I don't fit our solution, fit our business uh, requirements, and so on. So here we go, introducing a remote procedure call. Uh, well, a remote procedure call, it's not a, a thing that's new. It has been around since, I don't know, 70s or something like that. Yeah, the, the whole purpose of an RPC um, system, uh, an RPC concept, is to make the system look and behave uh, like they're a monolith. Yeah, so you have a distributed system, and using uh, remote procedure calls, you might get the feeling that you have this, the whole uh, thing in one place. Yeah, so let's have a uh, look at some code. Yeah, so what we have here is an order. We call a create order. We have a payment status that we uh, want uh, to process the payment for, and if that payment is successful, yeah, well, we might arrange the shipping for it. Yeah, I named it maybe not so uh, so good, but if we look at this code, there's nothing telling us that there might be a network involved whenever we call the method. Yeah, it's just call a method approach. We're calling the process payment for the specific order. We arrange the shipping for this specific order. So it's just method calls. It's not a new HTTP client. It's not visible that we're behind the scenes are doing HTTP requests. Right, so this is what RPC as a concept does. It has a network that it becomes hidden once we uh, uh, we use it. So RPC would make the code look local, right? We process the payments. It looks like it's in the same system, like it's in there. Yeah, so it has this look and feel of call a method, take there, um, instantiate something, call the method, and so on. Yeah, because the, uh, the main goal of an RPC is to have a distributed system behave, behave like a monolith. Okay, and since it's doing that, the communication through the network is transparent. It's not like, it's, yeah, you look through it, you're not seeing that it's there. So here we are introducing gRPC. So gRPC started in 2001, so it's not that new anymore. It's new in our .NET ecosystem. Uh, it was open source like many other projects that we currently use. Uh, and well, fast forwarding a few <coughs> years, we got it in .NET in 2019. Since then, um, I will tell you that a lot of the tooling that is used for gRPC improved. So now things are way stable, so now I, I can use the thing in production because also the tooling helps me. But back then, things weren't that, uh, that stable. So there was, to me at least, there was nothing that would have made me sad, okay, I'm going to use this tomorrow in a production environment. Yeah. But nowadays, if you ask me the same thing, I would say, yes, I'm using this, and I'm going to use this for specific scenarios. What is gRPC? So gRPC is con contract-based, and it means that we will have no more right-click add reference package, and so on. Uh, it, the only thing that will be common between all our projects using uh, gRPC will be a file. Yeah. How would you distribute that file? Well, it's up to you. I'm going to talk about it uh, by the end. <coughs> It uses HTTP2 by default. It was especially made for this, which will make it faster. And now we're going to say, OK, but I can also use HTTP2 with a web API, right? Yeah, well, uh, 
you can use HTTP2 with a web API, but it won't use the, uh, the protocol at its fullest. Another thing that is very nice about gRPC is that it has a different serialization called protobuf, which will give you a smaller payload. I did a few tests, and it gave me for the same uh, data about 50% 50, uh, 50 smaller payload, which is big. I mean, you're going to reduce your <laughs> data transfer over the network with 50%, which is awesome. And if you top that with compression, it becomes even better. And another thing is that it's available in many languages. It does code generation out of the box. It will generate client for you and the code that you're specifying there. And it's all done by the, the compiler, the Proto C compiler. OK, so where does the gRPC concept fit in? So how do we introduce in, in our uh, system? So with ABI, we had the client, we had the server. But now, in between those, we will have something that is common and known by, by both parties. We will have this proto file, which is a file with a special syntax. So basically, the, the thing that is common, it will be in between. You'll have a file that is known both to the consumer and both to the server. Yeah, that's it. So if with Web API, for example, I know I, I've seen it in the teams that I worked with, they created Nugget packages to distribute HTTP clients. Strongly typed ones, la la la, they have retries policy already involved in there. But the thing with that, it was that the library that's supposed to be just the client to be sent and used in every um, microservice tended to, I don't know, to re inherit business logic, which wasn't that nice. Yeah, so since you do not have the possibility of, I don't know, distributing Nugget packages, and you have only this file, you're not prone to errors. You won't have spaghetti code in your, uh, in your system. So how the proto file looks like? It's fairly strange. It's a fairly different terminology. But in the end, this file will be generated, and it will, be, it will output C-sharp code. Yeah? So it will output uh, classes. The first thing that you have to do is to specify the syntax version for the protocol buffers. Then you need to specify if you want the namespace under which the class will be generated. And then you will need to specify what are you exposing? What are your operations? What are the, the types that you want to uh, define in here? So you do that by simply specifying the service keyword, the name of the service. Uh, and you're going to say, hey, I have an RPC method, because this is what we expose, name compute Fibonacci of type requested number that returns a Fibonacci result. Uh, the thing here is that you cannot ha have operations that have no uh, parameters. You would have to have something, even though if that something is empty. Yeah, so you will define a type that has no properties inside it. Or use the, the things that are already uh, created by Google. A message, as you'll see here, uh, the requested number is the name, and then inside it you have like a field. Yeah, but that is not a field. It will become a property once the protocol compiler will run. Um, and the requested number will become a C-sharp class that you will be able to use. Yeah, the thing is, in 32 number equals 1, that is not an assignment. That is uh, the order in the binary string. Yeah, so once you add uh, many properties, you will add them and you will equal the number and the word that you want to have it in the binary string. Yeah, so this is how it looks like. It, we will have a look at some code right away. Okay, so um, now you have to know another syntax. Now you have to define uh, files, new files, and these files are the ones that are getting distributed to your system. Yeah, so how you distribute them, because you will have no more right-click add reference or install Nugget package. Well, some people are having separate repositories for it, and some people are just pointing, um, are just referencing these files from a specific location on the disk, on the network, or somewhere on the web. Okay, we're going to see that in action uh, soon enough. One of the powers of gRPC is that it uses the protocol behind the scenes. And uh, it provides something that it's called gRPC types or modes, which 
are four of them. One of them is, stream, is Unary, that mimics client-server request response pattern that we know yeah, from the web API. And the, second, uh, the next three ones can be uh, named as streaming types, because those will do streaming. First one will be the service streaming, then client streaming, and then a combination of these two. The thing is, whenever streaming happens, it happens on one TCP connection. Yeah? So what will happen is that a consumer, usually still a, a server, will issue a request. That request will be uh, uh, processed, and you will send the response back. Yeah? How do you define such method in your uh, service uh, profile? Well, easy. You say that it's a RPC, you give it a name, you give it an input, and you also give a return type that you also need to define. The deal is, the consumer needs to initiate the communication. Yeah? So it, the server cannot say, hey, I'm going to send you messages. No, it doesn't work like that. Server streaming is a client initiating opening a communication channel, the server receiving uh, that uh, request, and then it will answer, answer with several things over the same uh, connection. So this is streaming. It will stream bytes of data. Um, so it's not signal R. It cannot like broadcast to different uh, clients. But the clients can open a communication channel, and it will reuse the same connection. Server streaming uh, can be uh, written just by using by adding the stream keyword near to the, the part that you want it. If you want to respond with a stream of outputs, then you add the stream, um, the stream keyword to the part that you want it to be streamed. Client streaming works in a similar manner, but this time the client sends several pieces of data over the same connection, and the server will respond with only one thing. Yeah? So um, how do you write that? by adding the stream keyword to the uh, part that will be streamed. Okay? Think about scenarios where we need to upload big uh, data, like, I don't know, uplo uploading a movie, uh, a recording, or something like that. We can chunk the big data on several little pieces, and we can stream it to the server. That would be a good scenario. Or another thing, maybe upload data from um, sen different sensors in the IoT scenarios. Think about it. You're opening a connection towards the server to send something, and you send something very often. With RPC, or gRPC, you might as well just open a connection, and whenever you have something to send, you will send over the same connection. So it won't be like new connection, new connection, new connection every time. It will be just one connection, and whenever you have something to say, send, you'll uh, reuse the, the same connection. Bidirectional, it works combining the two um, parts. And how do we write that? Just by adding the stream keyword to the input and to the output. That's it. OK, so uh, let's demo some things. I think I'm going to just make sure that everyone sees what I have here. Okay, <coughs> going to try to zoom it in. Uh, the default project, with Visual Studio at least, it has uh, things that we already know. It has a program CS, it has an app settings, but it will have no, no controller folder like Web API does. It will have a Protos folder and a services. Yeah. So let's have a look here. In the Protos fol uh, folder, you add your protocol buffer files. Yeah? So I hope this is visible far back. That's the best I can do. OK, so I have a service um, named Greeter um, with four methods. One of them is unary server streaming. You'll see that it has only um, an input, but it returns a stream of responses. So it's, it's going to be one thing in and several things out. This is gonna, uh, how it's going to work. On the client stream, it's the other way around. It has a lot of inputs, and it will return only one thing out. And in the bi bidirectional part, it will be many ins, many outs. Yeah. 
So depending on uh, what we have. The messages that are defined, uh, I call them requests. I call them, I gave them like a single property because the purpose was to show you how it really works, not to make complicated things. Um, once you define these messages, you can define like your types, a correspondent um, from your C-sharp classes in here. You can import them just like you would do for uh, with CSS files. Yeah, you import one here to there, one thing there, and it's going to work uh, in the end. You can also define like nested types if that's the case. So maybe the request will have another property that is of type message and so on and so forth. What happens is whenever you build this, uh, this thing, something will be generated for you. You'll find that uh, generated file under here in uh, the deb debug object debug net version that you have. You'll see that there will be like two separate classes generated on build. So what Visual Studio does is to run a proto C CLI command and obtain this. So you can also do it by hand if you want without using Visual Studio. Okay, and these classes have a funky looking. Uh, yeah, we do not. I advise you not to modify this <laughs> because otherwise uh, the results won't be predictable. Client gRPC here, the same. This is the generated. Is the uh, you see the classes are generated as being partial. It ha they have the name that you generated. You have the service, um, the namespace in there, and stuff like that. Okay, so what? we do with this generated code because okay we obtained that but we also need to give it an implementation because it's not only necessary okay i'm gonna do the definition here um who here worked with soap services having that whistle file yeah <coughs> i could say that i might be opinionated but this proto file might be the version the modern version of the whistle <laughs> yes because if we look at that we see what we are exposing. Yeah, there will be a method called say hello that will receive this as an input and will output that as an output. Yeah, so uh, it's our job to take the generated code and to give an actual implementation to be used further. Yeah, so what we're gonna do? We will create a service, and then once we create the service, we will have to register it in a startup to be bundled. Yeah, and when we do that, we might go ahead and say, hey, um, I needed to extend Greeter, Greeter Base. Greeter Base is automatically generated, is the funky looking code that we've seen. Yeah, and in there, if we write, hey, public override something, it will give us what we have to be generated. Yeah, in here, I, I already uh, wrote the code for every method, but if I haven't d uh, done that, I would uh, be prompted, hey, you can override the say hello. Yeah, so the say hello method, uh, it will be an override from the base that is generated with Proto-C compiler. Uh, it has an, I don't know what happens. It has a request, a request um, as a parameter, and it has a second parameter that we cannot get rid of, called server call context. Okay, what's happening? My laptop is acting out, which is not cool at all. Okay, and the server call context, it's something that relates to the gRPC request itself. You can obtain from there, for example, the actual HTTP context that we all know from Web API or MVC. We can call the context parameter, get HTTP context, and we'll get everything in there. We can access the headers, we can access everything that's HTTP related and we all know. And we can even access the current user if we have authentication in place. Yeah. Or if we have uh, client certificates and stuff like that. Okay, so now that we have the server, and uh, by the way, you're going to have access to this code at the end, so no, uh, no need to take pictures or something like that. Okay, what I'm going to show you is I have a few console apps running. One of them will be the server that I just show you um, running. Let me clear this out. So I'm going to do .NET 
R sorry, run no build. And what's going to happen is that it's going to listen on this port. So now, once my gRPC server is up, I can uh, do re gRPC requests to it. And how will I do that? Just by using other console apps. What I have in here is a unary console application. Uh, so nothing fancy. But I want you to see that under the dependencies, I have no dependency to, uh, to my server. So basically, it doesn't know which the where is the server, what is the server code, and stuff like that. It doesn't know. Yeah. The only thing that this specific project knows is where is my proto protocol file, basically. Yeah. So if I ri uh, right click and say, I'm going to edit the project, I'm going to see a thing here. Say, hey, I'm going to include uh, from the server project protos folder a file named greet. And in here, I'm going to behave like I am a, oh wow, it's acting out. Like I'm a client, so I'm going to be a client for, um, for, for a server. Another thing that we could do in here, which is fairly new in Visual Studio and it helps a lot, is to simply say right click, add, and you'll say add service reference. And from here, you're going to see this prompt that is going to ask you, hey, what do you want to add? an open API, a WCF, or a gRPC. And if you click gRPC, it's going to prompt you to browse and find uh, the file that you want to be visible to this specific project. And if you click browse, um, you're going to go to the server part. You're going to see the protocol file. Select the grid proto. Uh, and here you can select what kind of what code you want it uh, to have. Client, server, client and server, or messages only. So only the types that you define, the request or the response um, kind. You're going to click Finish. And you see it's going to install or not <laughs> a few projects. That's an older version. Uh, but in the end, it will uh, make the classes generated for you discoverable in this project. So you can either do that, and it will work if you have a new project. Or you can either go and uh, just edit this and add by hand the location of the file and the fact that uh, this is a client. On the server side, I'm going to show you the difference for this. On the server side, if you edit the project file, you'll notice that it has pretty much the same thing. Yeah, So it, pro uh, it points to the grid proto file. And it says that this in here behaves like a server. So that's what it makes um, a specific project be the client, so the consumer of a service, or the service itself. Yeah, and every time you need to, uh, you want and need to add another protocol file, you need to make sure that you include it in here to be discoverable, um, and also that you register the service. Okay, things code related. Since I show you how you can add and reference a, a protocol file. I can also show you how you can consume a specific um, service. So what's going to happen? Using this gRPC net client, this is the nugget package that you will need to install in order to make something work with gRPC to consume gRPC services. You can say, hey, I need for this specific address, our server will run under this port. I needed to create a channel, so it's a communication channel. Yeah. So once you create that and pass options to it, you can also send, for example, that um, you can configure your try policies in there, uh, out of the, the box, uh, hedging policies. You can pass their uh, like authentication uh, things, like uh, token bearers, stuff like that. So that's at HTTP level. Below, you will see that we are creating clients that are pretty much similar to what we use in Web API clients. You create a client, you instantiate the client, pass the address, stuff like that, and then just call methods. That's what hap happens here. So greeter, greeter client, it is part of those funky looking classes generated from our proto file. And we'll simply pass the channel in it. And then we need to create our request, pass it a value, and just call the the uh, use the client and call the method that we, uh, we want. So we're going to call in here, say hello, passing in the request. 
Okay, so you he uh, see in here the client has what we defined the proto file. We have bidirectional, client stream, uh, server stream, and so on. Yeah, so uh, the client itself, used from another app, want to know if you implemented the actual logic for the specific method. But once you defined it in here, it will be visible and discoverable. But it will throw exceptions that, hey, yeah, it's not implemented. Yeah, so it's up to you to provide the actual logic in your uh, service. Getting back to our demo, server is listening. And on the right side, I'm going to have another client app that will do uh, will run our uh, console consumer. So I'm going to do .NET run. Yeah. So what we see here is that it's sending a message, and it gets back a response with Oslo value, which uh, is the value that we sent. And it also adds another thing, uh, the, the server that it runs, because I'm, I'm going to show you the, um, the client load balancing. OK, so let's see what happened on the server side, because that's very important. I'm going to try and do this. On the server side, we will see that these are HTTP2. Yeah, so th that's the port that it runs on. It is a post request. So every time you're uh, using, a, you're making a gRPC call, it will be an actual post request. So you cannot have like get request, post updates, um, patch, delete, and stuff, stuff like that, uh, which comes with a drawback. Having posts means you'll have no caching. Yeah, so the only thing that you'll benefit from is the uh, small payload, uh, the serialization, and um, pretty much that's it. And you'll see that it calls endpoint. Um, greeter, greet, say hello. This is the endpoint. It's not an actual endpoint. It's an operation over the network. And it has the application gRPC MIME type in here. Yeah, So that will happen every uh, single time you'll do uh, call a gRPC uh, operation. OK, so that's what happens on the server side. You'll see here that, that I turned in um, the trace logging option. And it, uh, it does and writes every single step that it uh, So it's sending the message. It serializes the server response. It has this amount of size. And then it compresses the message with the gzip encoding. Uh, and then it actually sends the message. And then it finished executing the endpoint so, and stuff like that. So you can get all these small steps just by turning the logging on uh, on trace. On this next part, since we're having unary, we will have to have a look at the client streaming, for example. The client streaming is super easy. Um, so basically, you're calling the method. And the simple uh, logic that I could add in here is just to have a for loop that will write to the request stream every, for every i that I send a new uh, request type. And then I'm going to wait uh, for the re uh, request stream to be complete. And well, just I, I'm going to write in the console. Let's see that in action. OK, so unary is done. The server is still listening. And on the client stream, I'm going to do the same, dot .net, net run. Hoping this won't. And what I want you to see on the left side, on the server part, is that it moves. <laughs> yeah, It receives things from the client. And it will keep receiving things until our i gets to the maximum value. Fingers crossed we're going to wait a bit. OK. And it stopped. It, uh, it said that, OK, it gzipped uh, the thing, received the message, reading the message, no message returned, stuff like that. And in here, uh, this number is the last value the server received. So it's w one single response to the client. Yeah. In here, uh, we sent many, 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 many messages from the client. The server will still be listening. And on the right-hand side, we're going to try the server side, server streaming. Server streaming means that once the client issues a request, it will receive a lot of things. 
back. So I'm going to do .NET run. You see, the server sends things, and the client sees those things and writes them in the console. It is the same uh, scenario with an eye that goes back. And I hope I didn't add too many, <laughs> too many eyes in there. Okay, stop it now. Where are we going to stop it? Oh uh, no, it stopped itself. Okay, so uh, this is what the server sent back. So this is the last value. And there's another thing that we're going to talk about um, in a few minutes. Okay, let's see how the client code looks like for this. Server streaming, it uses the same approach. It opens the channel. Yeah, it passes in the address where it can find the server. And then it simply calls the server stream with a new request. Yeah. And for which response received, it will write the, uh, the response in the console. Yeah, so this is a simple code, just I, I waiting and reading from the response stream. Yeah, so on one part it's uh, writing to the response stream, and this uh, is reading for the, uh, from the response stream. Okay, um, let's see also on the server side how the, the service looks like. So server stream, yeah, writes a message and writes in the response to, to push things to the client. Yeah. Um, you'll see here that you have the request, so the type that you get in, and then you have a server stream, uh, I server stream writer, which means that you need to use that to write, just like you would use it with a memory stream. And then the server call context that you cannot get rid of it, it will be there. The only thing that will be uh, funny about it, the server call context, it's when you're going to implement like a unit test over gRPC, you will have to, to pass that also as a parameter. Okay, and the uh, bidirectional one, um, I'm going to demo soon enough. So you have an iStream stream reader, you have to read from the, the cl uh, consumer, and you'll have to write back, and you'll have the, the context in there. And then, uh, while you still have things in the request stream, because the one that initiates the communication channel is the client, so you'll have to see, while I have something to read from, I'm going to also write what I can receive. So that's the, the biggest logic in here. You can accept, uh, access the current uh, message from the gRPC channel by using requeststream.current. So that will give you um, the type that is sent in, uh, request, usually. Okay, let's see how that looks like. So we have the server listening, and then we have the bidirectional one, which is going to do the same, .NET run. Yeah, so what I want you to see is that it's sending an I going to this value, and then um, the server says, okay, I'm gonna <laughs> I received this, and sends basically the value back. Uh, one thing, I'm going to run it again with a no build this time. Just and save some time. And I'm going to run it again until I get a scrambled uh, kind of looking. Yeah, finally. You, you'll see here that it's it looks like it's not in order. Yeah, but uh, in fact, the order is guaranteed. Once you're sending uh, data, the data received on the server side is guaranteed. Yeah, so it's not uh, scrambled around. So as you can see here, it's still in order. Sending seven, then sending eight, then sending nine. Yeah, and on the server side, server said it receives zero, then one, then two, and three, and st stuff like that. So uh, they're not saying like, okay, receive the first one and then the seventh one and stuff like that. It's it's in order, even though the order is kind of uh, combined. Okay, mm, what else I need to show you here? If you have questions, I'm here. Um, one thing, getting back to the internals of gRPC, there are a few things that they brag about <laughs> and they, that you need to know. For example, in gRPC, the status codes are not the status codes that we know. Uh, and that might be like confusing. 
When it comes to uh, gRPC, you will have like 16 status codes specific to the gRPC request itself. And then on top of that, you have the HTTP ones that we all know, like 404, 401, 403, uh, that we all use with Web API. Yeah. Another thing is um, everything related to data validations and um, uh, bad things happening in um, gRPC, it's an exception. You'll throw exceptions every time a thing that doesn't work as expected. Yeah, so you'll have to uh, filter that if you have a specific need. For example, I uh, should be in here. One of them. In here, yeah? So on the bi-directional one, you'll see that I, I'm using um, a try-catch block and say, hey, in case of an R RPC exception, do something. But now we have the option of just filtering. If the status code is cancelled, write this. So you can do that for every other things that you need. For example, if the data that you're sending is not valid, throw an exception and catch it on the client side. One thing is that uh, once you're putting it in production, you'll have to map the status codes with messages that you add to uh, middleware, maybe, to create like a generic uh, way of treating exception in writing um, error codes. OK, another thing that worth, uh, needs to be mentioned is that you can cancel uh, requests. You can specify, for example, for each a call that, hey, if I do not get a response back in this amount of time, kill it. So treat it as, okay, I do not care anymore. It takes too much time. Also, you can pour call to send a cancellation token. So if something takes too much, you can like always forget about it. And this is uh, for every method that you can define in there. Another thing uh, be besides um, RPC exceptions, <coughs> it's going to display, yeah, um, is around interceptors. You'll have an additional way of injecting yourself in the request pipeline besides middlewares. You can intercept and write code to intercept uh, the calls uh, port type. You can intercept unary calls on the consuming part, you can do logging and add authorization details in there, and then you can intercept the server side just right before the, the method is executed. So you can add a read in there like headers or add other headers and stuff like that. So that will be run after the middleware is run. So it's somehow at a lower level than um, the framework um, middlewares. Okay, uh, request headers it will be still request headers at the protocol level. Uh, response headers the same, but you'll have an additional um, way of sending metadata called response trailers. This can be attached under the form of key, of key value pairs, like this. These are simply, you can add them from the server implementation. You can also read them there if needed. Okay, let me minimize this, like this. So you'll have like um, this type, this is the type that they decided to use, metadata, and a metadata entry, you add a key, and you add a, a value, and then just simply write into the context response trailer and add uh, this key value, right? And on the client side, the consuming party, where is it? Here. Yeah, so you will find some trailer values in the gRPC response. This is the, the header that I added and uh, I, d I checked if those are there or not. Okay, uh, there are other things that you can tweak for the any gRPC request. For example, you can specify uh, that the maximum message size is an amount that is suitable for you. Uh, there is a a guideline somehow that no message size should be more than one megabyte because otherwise you'll see performance penalties. So it's not intended for you to transfer gigabytes of data over gRPC messages. Yeah, there are other technologies for that. But you can 
chunk that gigabyte into one megabyte pieces and send over the, the network. Um, Max, uh, maximum send message size the same, it can be configured. Then you can configure, for example, the compression level, the compression algorithm, and to specify your own compression provider if you want. And of course, you can add uh, the type of interceptors that um, you need here. Security-wise, uh, whatever your web API supports, gRPC supports it too. But you will have two options. You will have it at the channel level, so at the HTTP level, and then you can have something at a more granular one or over the single TCP call. Yeah? So you have HTTP and then gRPC call inside it. <coughs> uh, it supports Azure AD. You can have client certificates, identity server, JVT. I should remove the token from there. OAuth, uh, OpenID Connect, everything that uh, is, um, is available pretty much. And it covers a lot of scenarios. What gRPC should do awesome besides this? So besides this, gRPC transcoding. So basically, it will allow you to have an internal gRPC service exposing the browser without any additional tools. The thing with that is that yet is not so stable. So if you combine it with any other things around the, um, our, your um, gRPC service, it might act out and not work, <laughs> as I found out, found out with my workshop. OK, so just a sec in here. Yeah, so you will have like, um, this is the address of the server. And then you can configure like the endpoint you wanted it to run. Come on, Zoom, help me out a bit. Yeah, so I said that I want it to be exposed under V1 greeter. And the name is the, the parameter. Yeah, so if I add here instead of name, I don't know, Madrid. It will be display. Whoops, whoops. I uh, need to run this. Debug start new instance. Yeah, hello Madrid. <laughs> uh, how I added this wonderful little feature is just by simply installing a Nugget package uh, related to transcoding. So in here, it's called Microsoft SP.NET Core gRPC transcoding. They couldn't have made this more longer. Yeah, add a few more segments. And you just have it in here. So this is the RPC say hello returns reply that we've seen before. But this time, we have the option of exposing it as a get, uh, get request under this specific endpoint. Yeah, you can also do that. You can also do a post, you can also do a put, a delete, just by adding it in here. Um, the thing is, uh, whatever name you're specifying in here, like to be bound from the endpoint itself, it will need to be uh, present in the hello request input in here. Yeah, so if you add here another name ID or ID or something like that, that it's not. Um, in the type, you see, this is the name that I'm going to be bound under here. I'm waiting for it to be disappear. <laughs> so to disappear, I try. <laughs> Come on. OK, so Zoom it doesn't want to behave this morning. Yeah, so it needs to have a. a OK, yay. It worked. So the name is also pr present in the field of the hello request, which hello request is the input of our method. Yeah, so it will have to be uh, there. There's a catch, though. It's not that easy. Just install a package and it will work by uh, by itself. The catch is is that you will need by hand to paste a few things, and those few things are this. I think they haven't yet invested in the tooling, and we have to do manual work if we have this specific scenario. For example, we need to have the Google folder. Inside it, we need to have an API folder. And inside the API folder, we need to uh, have two protocol files. These are basically the ones that help with transcoding. Yeah, The thing is, you'll have to do it just once, and then you're going to copy the whole structure in your project. Uh, yet, I th hope that they will be, uh, improve this. And another thing is that in your greeter uh, file, you'll have to import it. 
So this is how imports work. This is how you add other files to your current file and stuff like that. It's just an import directive pointing to the specific, uh, specific folder in the, the current project. Okay, uh, another thing that's supposed to be uh, nice about gRPC, and it's actually nice, but I'm not seeing it having a real applicability, it's client-side load balancing. And let me show you something. Done with the transcoding and have this extras. So uh, I'm going to start with re uh, re retry policy first because that's even uh, nice. So you can specify um, a retry policy out of the box. Say, uh, I'm going to have a maximum of temps of two, initial back off, a maximum back off, and the retriable status codes for me are this, like unavailable and deadline exceeded. You can have uh, many of them uh, in there. So what you're going to do is just to pass this retry policy when you create the channel. Yeah, so we're going to uh, pass the retry policy as the channel op options here. I'm going to do it here because I didn't prepare it yet. Uh, so method configs, I'm going to open another project that already has it. Yeah. So you can specify either um, hedging policy or retry policy and it will simply uh, work. The thing is you won't be able to see it uh, from the outside because the retry is internal so you won't see anything logged in around it but you won't have like to install um, poly or something like that it will have itself like in, in gRPC uh, library um, a thing that I think uh, will be the last thing that I'm going to show you today it's around uh, client-side load balancing this is the thing that I told you I'm not seeing it as having a real applicability with client-side load balancing, you're basically moving the awareness of where, what are the servers on the client. Yeah. So I don't think that the client should be aware what are his options. But okay, I can connect there. I can connect there. When the load balancing policies, the load balancing uh, concepts, are supposed to be transparent. Okay, you're gonna connect, and you're gonna be served from somewhere. Do you care from where as long as you get a response back? Um, no, you shouldn't care. Yeah, But in here, we can uh, configure, for example, a static resolver factory. We're going to say, hey, I know that I will have an instance of the server running on this address and another instance of my server running on this address. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to... This is what you'll have to do if you have uh, console apps like me. If you have an MVC or a web API or something else, you won't have to do the, all the wiring. Okay, you're going to say that I have a singleton resolver factory. This is my factory. And then when you create the channel, you have to say that, hey, um, I have this balancing config. I want you to, uh, to use the round robin config. You also can use the pick first, but that would be like your load balancing. You're always going to pick the first server uh, in there. And then uh, just pass it in the fa factor. Build a service provider that you just uh, created in here. Yeah. So what's going to happen is whenever you create a client with the channel that has all the options, uh, it will know to connect to the server, or to the sec second server, and to the third server that you have and something like that. So let's see, we have a server instance running, and then we should have uh, a second service we should have, is a keyword. Okay, I'm gonna, mm, this. I'm gonna have the same server running, but under this, um, this URL. So 5000 and 5002. Of course, because I need to pass it. No build. <coughs> I pass it no build while you're building. Okay. Uh, Just a sec, I'm gonna clear this out. I stopped Visual Studio because it's either you run it from the console or you end the double code indeed. What do you want? What is it locked? You removed the uh, no build. 
I removed no build, but it should have worked without it. Apparently, I didn't pray to the demo gods too much. And now it works. Ah. Okay. Fingers crossed. No. Build, please. Okay. So it's listening on this. We have the, sec uh, the first one to make run. So. Run. No build. Because this is the default. Okay, yay. We have two server instances. This port and this one. So listening. And what I'm going to do is run the awesome uh, app that knows about these two servers with the same options, .NET, <coughs> run, no build, because otherwise I do not know what's going to happen. Okay, yay. Uh, and it said a hello back with Oslo value from localhost this port. And if I run it again, hopefully, in one of the times, it should be the other port around which is this. Yeah, so it know how to balance it, uh, it himself, which is rather nice. Okay. So this is what uh, supposed to, to do good. Okay. What are the benefits? And I'm going to wrap it up. So benefits would be around performance, size, and the data that you're transferring over the network. I did some tests, and if you also compressed compress the, um, the response, you'll end up like only one-fourth of the entire message you would have with web, web API. It's good for polyglot environments, but uh, as we've seen, we, <laughs> we don't even have that in real life. Uh, it will have low network usage because the this, this small uh, payload. It's awesome for point-to-point -point communication, and it's awesome if you're using uh, HTTP APIs on your downstream APIs. So you might have, uh, have a look uh, at, maybe you can try to, to switch it to gRPC in one of the cases. It uses uh, uh, HTTP to multiplexing under the hood, which is nice. Uh, it's contract-based, supports different streaming types over the, uh, the a single TCP connection, and it's already, it can be configured with HTTP 3. Yeah, so I don't know about you, but um, I just got my hand around HTTP 2, and now they're talking about the next version, HTTP 3. So it's hard to keep up, <laughs> to be fair. Um, it will still have a temporal copying, so you'll still need the server to be up in order to be served from it. Um, you might forget that there is network involved, and you might abuse uh, the calls. Um, it's human readable now, because Postman, it has um, a version of um, it allows you to do gRPC requests directly from that. You need better testing and you need to treat the, the status codes that you receive in exceptions. It will have no more caching. So if you want caching, you might have a look at the middle layer that caches your data, stuff like that, which might add an extra complexity in your system. Okay? You'll have a single point of truth, which it's in a way it's good. You'll have the proto file that will be the, the truth for everything. Um, so, when and why gRPC? There are specific cases, but if you currently have like a web API responding to another web API, you might give this a try to see how it goes, and maybe it will benefit your system. Yeah, so I truly believe that when it comes to distributed systems, everything is about trade-offs. So you won't have like a silver bullet to fix everything uh, around your systems. But we really need to know the tools that we have at our hand to be able to make informed decisions when it comes to evolving the architecture or simply just writing a simple API, being it a gRPC or a uh, web API itself. Next steps would be to uh, for you to have a look at these things. It might, be, uh, might appear on your radar um, in the next few uh, years, maybe. And you have these two books that may be worth having a look. Mark Randall uh, wrote one of them. If you have WCF, it might also be a good fit to try um, gRPC instead. And thanks for listening. Thank you for being here. You have the resources in here. <laughs>